James Baldwin was born on August 2, 1924 at Harlem Hospital in New York City as James Arthur Jones. Several years later, his mother would marry a much older laborer and Baptist preacher from Louisiana. James would then take the surname of his stepfather. At age 19, he was torn between his desire to write and his need to take on menial jobs, fearing becoming like his stepfather who had been unable to properly provide for his family. He was fired from a track laying job, then from a meat packing job after falling asleep at the plant. He became listless and unstable, drifting from one odd job to the next. He was a heavy drinker. He endured the first of his nervous breakdowns. Then, at age 22, his friend Eugene Worth committed suicide by jumping into the Hudson River. Fearing a similar fate, James knew he had to do something drastic. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, revolutionaries, and the adventurous. I'm your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin, and on this episode, we explore the literary beginnings of James Baldwin. Quote, Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. End quote. He fled to Paris, France, where he threw himself into a frantic search for the kind of companionship that would satiate his craving to be loved as himself, not as a son or a brother or a black man, but as a human being with flesh and blood needs. The result of his unconventional life in Paris during his twenties was a head-on confrontation with his own identity as a man and a writer a confrontation that occurred with a directness and speed that would have been unlikely in New York. Ironically, one of the first discoveries he made about himself was that Europe did nothing to change his heritage. He was as much a black man in Paris as he had been in New York. He also found out just as quick that Paris was no cure for sexual ambivalence. On the surface, he settled into the bohemian life with little difficulty, but there was a worry within him. It was all very good and well being able to live on a steady diet of alcohol, cigarettes, and good conversations, but he had a mission to accomplish. In his sporadic journal entries, he wrote of the Vernoy group, a group of men and women who shared rooms, food, alcohol, drugs, and friendship suggesting that they were all unhappy and clinging to delusions. He worried that he was sliding into a lazy lifestyle, one which was destroying him. In particular, his alcohol consumption was becoming a problem. In January of 1949, he would fall ill. On one morning during his period of illness, he decided that coming to Paris had perhaps been a mistake. Here he was, in bed, sick, and not getting much done. True, being abroad had allowed him time for a self-examination, but what he had discovered, an admittance made in his journal, was not a pretty sight. Still, with perseverance, he might learn to accept himself for what he was or was not. He reminded himself of the sick Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment, as Dostoevsky had become, for the moment at least, his favorite novelist. Recovering from his illness, he began several essays about his life in Paris. Eventually, these would become Encounter on the Senna, published first in the reporter as The Negro in Paris. After his illness and a brief first trip to London in a futile search for magazine contracts, he turned to an article on homosexuality. The Preservation of Innocence is his first full statement of a theme that would go on to become one of his trademarks. Desperate for money, however, he agreed to take a job as a singer in an Arab nightclub. 
A German-American lawyer whom he had met prior saved him from that job by employing him as a clerk. Not surprisingly, he did not work out as a clerk and was soon let go. But the firing did not seem to bother him. By then, he was well occupied with an actor called Jacques. Also, Otto Friedrich's published diaries report that he had been seen eating and drinking with the likes of Jean-Paul Sartre, Max Ernst, Truman Capote, Stephen Spender, and Simone de Beauvoir, among others. Most likely on account of his reputation, an American named Frank Price agreed to advance him money to give him time to write. Baldwin checked into a hotel, and using his second-hand portable typewriter, he immediately got to work. For several days, however, the hotel desk clerk requested that he hold off on the typing for a few days because the proprietor in the room next to him was dying. And when the man did in fact die, he returned to his typing with death very much on his mind. He managed to complete a story called The Death of the Prophet, the precursor of Notes of a Native Son, which would be published by Commentary in 1950. Unfortunately, he would fall ill once again and be hospitalized in early November 1949, having to undergo an operation for an inflamed gland. After this second hospitalization, he returned to Paris where he moved into the Grand Hotel du Bac. A gloomy place, the Grand Hotel du Bac would be the scene of an event that was at once terrifying and comical. According to Baldwin, in his own words, the Grand Hotel du Bac was one of those enormous, dark, cold, and hideous establishments in which Paris abounds that seem to breathe forth in their airless, humid, stone-cold halls, the weak light, scurrying chambermaids, and creaking stairs, an odor of gentility long, long dead. The place was run by an ancient Frenchman dressed in an elegant black suit which was green with age, who cannot properly be described as bewildered or even as being in a state of shock since he had really stopped breathing around 1910. <laughs> How's that for a Yelp review? Back to our story. Sometime early in December of 1949, he came across an acquaintance from New York a young man exploring Paris on his parents' money. The man wanted to leave his hotel, and although James had little in common with this friend, he missed home, and after all, the man was an American, so James suggested that he move to the Grand Hotel du Bac. Now, upon arriving, the friend brought a bedsheet from the hotel he had been staying at as a souvenir and gave it to James, who had been having difficulty getting the staff to change his bedsheets. Then, just before Christmas, police arrived at the friend's room in search of the stolen bedsheet. The owner of the prior hotel did not recognize the playful American tradition of taking a souvenir hotel towel or, in this case, a bedsheet. A failing to find the bedsheet in the friend's room, they were directed to Baldwin's room upstairs, and soon both men were under arrest. He and the friend were taken to a commissariat and placed in a cage-like cell where they were to spend the night. Now for Baldwin, this was a new and terrifying experience. Here in Paris, where he had come to be free, he found himself facing policemen who were no better or worse than their American counterparts. Only the fact that he did not understand these people made the situation just a bit different. He was not able to use the weapons he had learned to apply in the context of American racism. In Paris, he was not a despised black man. He was like his bedsheet-stealing friend, simply an American. He was an equal in Paris. The police led him handcuffed downstairs to the bottom of the building into a great enclosed shed. In the shed were vagrants, beggars, and petty thieves, the very scrapings off the Paris streets. In the center of the shed was a great hole, the common toilet, near which stood 
an old man with white hair eating a piece of camembert. Baldwin then wondered whether he would ever see home again or whether the old man was a shade of his future. It seemed like he had escaped Harlem only to wind up in a different hell. It was the day before Christmas Eve when the case of the bed sheet came to trial. However, the lack of an interpreter caused a postponement until after the holiday. The purgatorial period was to be prolonged, leaving him hanging in a kind of void between Christmas memories of his mother's fried chicken and the cold prison floor. December 27th, the case goes to trial again, and fortunately, the case was dismissed. Free at last, but it was the reaction of the courtroom that finally brought him to the realization of what being a black man meant. The laughter that erupted in the courtroom when the bedsheet incident was cleared up reminded him of the same laughter he had heard at home, the laughter of those who consider themselves to be at a safe remove from all the wretched, the laughter of those for whom the pain of living is not real. Emotionally deadened by the incident, he returned to the Grand Hotel du Bac. There to greet him was the landlady, who had an ultimatum. The money for his bill in an hour, or leave immediately. In his room, he tied one of the dirty bedsheets to a water pipe, stood on a chair, tied the loose end of the bedsheet around his neck, and jumped. The only thing that gave way was the water pipe, Rebaptized by the flood water from the broken pipe, he found himself overcome by a kind of laughter that was more powerful than the laughter in the court. He threw some clothes in a duffel bag and rushed down the stairs into the bright streets and never returned to the Grand Hotel du Bac. By the autumn of 1951, he was in one of his periodic states of deep depression. His friend and part-time lover Lucian and friend Mary were worried about his state of mind. So it was agreed that Lucian would take him to Switzerland, where Lucian's family owned a small chateau, a place where they hoped he'd be able to finish his novel, Crying Holy. Lucian lured his father into giving him money by telling him he had tuberculosis and desperately needed treatment. The two men lived on that money in Lush le bon during the winter of 1951-52 with help from a girlfriend of Lucien's called Susie, who came on weekends with extra food she was able to spirit away from her family's house. The winter spent in the village was at once disturbing and idyllic. This time with Lucien was the closest James ever came to his dream of a domestic life with a lover. Lucien painted while he wrote during the day. In the evenings, the couple strolled through the village to the local cafe, where they ate sufficiently and drank a great deal. They laughed, told each other stories of childhood, and shared dreams. James was thoroughly in love with Lucien, and Lucien was fascinated by this magnetic man whose strange eyes commanded attention. A man whose touch was gentler and more caring, even as it was more demanding than any he had ever known. As he listened late each night to James reading aloud from the emerging chapters of Crying Holy, now titled Go Tell It on the Mountain, he barely understood the words, his English being limited, but he fell in love with the voice, and he sensed a great talent. James was a city person, however, and was always nervous in settings dominated by raw nature. The mountains were, in the end, threatening rather than inspiring. In the city he could blend in, in this village he was an eternal outsider. About the village he would write, No movie house, no bank, no library, no theater, very few radios, one jeep, one station wagon, and, at the moment, one typewriter, mine an invention which the woman next door to me here had never seen. From all available evidence, no black man had ever set foot in this tiny Switz village before I came. Now, the villagers had been told that he was an American, but to them he was African, like the several Africans the village church bought each year for the missionaries. The villagers were friendly enough, though, 
They wanted to touch his hair and rub his skin to see if the blackness would come off the way it came off the village children who dressed up as Africans each year at carnival time. As he walked through the village streets, those same children shouted in a perfectly friendly way, Nigger! Nigger! having no idea of the echoes it provoked in him. Thus, the three months in Le Chlebon, the winter of 1951-52, saw a confrontation not only with his autobiographical novel, but with his identity as an American and as a non-European black man. The two confrontations melded well. The village stay and his sense of alienation as a black man in a European setting made him long for home, family, and roots. But he knew that in order to return home, he would have to finish the novel that he had gone to Europe to write. Then, on February 26, 1952, he and Lucien took the somewhat battered manuscript down the mountain to a post office and sent it off to New York. Several months later, when Alfred Knopf expressed an interest in the novel and in meeting the author, Baldwin, with a loan from his old friend Marlon Brando, who happened to be passing through Paris, bought a ticket home. He could now go home, because in Go Tell It on the Mountain, he had faced something in himself and in his history, which made at least a partial reconciliation with his stepfather's ghost a possibility. In the weeks that followed his arrival, he negotiated with Knopf over changes the editors wanted made in the novel. He finally agreed to rewrite parts of the book in return for a $250 advance. Knopf agreed to pay $750 more when the book was finished. During the next three months, James spent time renewing his relationship with his family. He ate many meals at their apartment and stayed there often working on the revision of Go Tell It on the Mountain and playing with his nine-year-old sister, Paula. The revision of Go Tell It on the Mountain was finished quite rapidly and sent off to Knopf in July of 1952. They accepted the manuscript and sent Baldwin the balance of his advance. Now he had to decide what to do. The America of 1952 was already experiencing McCarthyism. The race problem was certainly nowhere close to being solved, and the great civil rights movement was yet to begin. He resented the fact that he could still be made to feel uncomfortable in restaurants or on the streets, and thus Paris still represented the possibility of freer movement and a kind of anonymity that he felt he needed. He realized that he had to establish himself more fully as a writer before he could face the political and social tension he felt was brewing in the U.S. So using a part of the money he had received from Knopf, he bought a ticket to France on the 28th of August. Saying goodbye to his mother again was difficult, but at least this time, unlike in 1948, he could afford to leave some money behind for household expenses. As usual, let's end this episode with a quote from the great and very important voice of James Baldwin. I love America more than any country in this world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemour Hardin. We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash house of words or paypal.me slash house of words podcast. Alternatively, you can subscribe and encourage others to subscribe to our YouTube page, House of Words Podcast. Every little bit helps more than you might think. Until next time, keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason Nemo Harden, and music by Creature Nine and Wood. 
All rights and ownership belong to Christo M. Sanchez and Jason Nemo Harden.